Welcome everyone to our November 17th board meeting. It is all Zoom, so bear with us as we get through this. Um, and what I'm gonna ask everybody to do after the roll call is please mute yourself because it gets really confusing during, during the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Just, I'll, I'll stay on and you can listen to me and you can all recite it, but with that many voices saying things, it gets really nasty, so. I, oh, I, don't, know how to, I don't know how to mute, how do I do that? Well, maybe, maybe Matt can do that for you. Can you do that for her, Matt? Look on the bottom left of your screen, Jan. It, it, if you, it might not show up unless you scroll your mouse down there. Right. If you're use... using the iPad, it's at the top. Oh, okay. I yeah, think she's I... got a computer. Okay, I see it. Let me practice, do it and see if it works. Yep. Got it. Okay. Very good. All right. Um, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. Commissioner Lambrick. Here. Commissioner Bunting. <laughs> Commissioner Murphy. Here. Commissioner Bailey. Here. Commissioner Smith. All right. Okay. After we've called the roll, it's time to have the the invocation and the pledge. And I would ask everybody if you just mute yourself so that we don't get a lot of confusion. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the stay that you've given to us and the blessings in it. We just pray, Father, through this time of COVID that you would pay extra special blessings upon all of our armed forces across the seas and at home. Our first responders, Father, who are are working in the hospitals every day and going out and trying to, to save our lives. And we just appreciate all those. And we ask you to be with this meeting tonight so that we could do the best that we could do for the folks of Gratia County. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, to the Republic. for which is one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, that being said, uh, agenda. Anything else needs to be added to the agenda? If not, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Support. Moved and supported. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I would ask the clerk to call the roll. Commissioner Bunting. Yes. Commissioner Lambrick. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Smith on yet? Commissioner Bailey. Yes. Okay. Do we have any public comment? Uh, Tracy here. I've uh, had a text from Sam that he is on his way. So um, so he's aware. He's on his way. What? On his way where? <laughs> yeah. To his computer, okay. maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay. Very good. All right. We don't have any public comment. Um, right now, we will have a uh, public hearing, and we will have to go into um, a public hearing mode here for the motion. This is to discuss the State Street renovation project in Elma. As you recall, the last meeting we set the public hearing and tonight we will have to have the public hearing in, in that regard. We will have several people, I assume, speaking. Um, I know we have uh, Jim Wheeler, Casey's on the line. So there'll be several people. So but first of all, we need to uh, make a, have a motion to go into public hearing. I would move that we go into the public hearing for the purpose of reviewing the Brownfield Redevelopment Authority proposal. I'll second it. Moved and supported. Do we have any other discussion? Having said that, ask the clerk to call the roll. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Smith, is he on yet? Commissioner Bunting. Yes. Commissioner Lambrick. Yes. Commissioner Bailey. Yes. All right, we're in the meeting. Um, 
And I would ask uh, someone from Greater Gratiot or whoever is going to speak to this to go ahead. Okay, uh, well, George, why don't I take over and uh, start with this, Jim Wheeler. Yep. Um, I think he's going to let me turn my boy. There we go. Um, in any case, what, what we have is a proposal from uh, Gemini Capital, which is Ryan Smith, who, to uh, talk about having a redevelopment or a brownfield opportunity in uh, downtown Alma. And for those of you who don't know it, that uh, Greater Grash uh, runs the uh, brownfield authority for the county, hence that's uh, why we're here presenting this tonight. Uh, the, the primary function behind this brownfield, which is a little different than what we see sometimes, is it's technically uh, the building's functionally obsolescent and obsolete. That's actually the same uh, type of uh, pr pr proposal that we had when we uh, took a look at the ZFS project, where it was a failed alcohol plant, became a bean processing plant, so a lot of the stuff out there was not usable for them, so hence it becomes functionally obsolescent to the building. In this case, you have a big old building, I think that used to actually be the J.C. Penney store downtown. It's now going to become a apartments on the upper story and a uh, boutique hotel on the first floor, which will consist of uh, nine rooms, which uh, again is a, a very, well, that's why we said boutique. It's not what you normally see in hotel sizes, but uh, given the, some of the demands that we've seen now in uh, the Alma market, especially with the college, Masonic Home Hospital and some other places, there has been a need for people to want to stay over that uh, don't want to travel to uh, Mount Pleasant for a uh, hotel and lodging. Uh, some of our local lodging has now uh, gone by the wayside, so uh, there's even higher demand right now for it. Um, two things, both it's the functional obsolescence, so a piece of it's being used in order to create the rooms, and the other side of it is, is they, uh, went in there and found significant amount of uh, asbestos that needed to be removed. And again, not uncommon in older buildings, but in order to get into it and uh, make it uh, workable for this type of a scenario, the uh, asbestos needed to be removed. Um, so it's a, so the, the total plan uh, size-wise for the whole project that, that, they're, uh, that it qualifies for is just about $334,000. So that's what they would be asking to be reimbursed as far as the, the Gemini Capital will pay that amount of money and then be reimbursed to a, to a tax, to a, what's called a TIF, back from, from that. The, the property has also been uh, classified as an OPRA, so there's an obsolete properties uh, tax abatement that's in, involved with it too, um, which will be sort of layered into this. But uh, sort of the long and short of that is the state doesn't recognize the OPRA designation, just the locals do. So by having the brownfield here, the, uh, the state actually, which and it's all taxpayer dollars, don't kid me wrong, but the state will be reimbursing about two thirds of this, about $230,000. And the local portion of it will be a little over 100, about 103,000. But uh, it's, so it, it's one of those. And, and the part about a brownfield that everybody just has to know is that it's, it's not a gain to the developer, it's just bringing it back so that it com it's comparable that if you were building something or something else as a standalone, that uh, this helps reimburse them for costs that they have to go through in order to bring a building back up to, to speed. And then in this case, remove asbestos also. So kind of dominate okay. the conversation, but uh, no, anybody, that's fine. if anybody has any questions or comments, but uh, the city, we had, a brown, we had a meeting with the city commission and uh, very much supportive of it. Uh, the Brownfield authorities met on it and uh, supportive of it. So this is the next step uh, is the public hearing and then the approval on the countywide. And then the final step is it has to go to the MSF, which is the Michigan Strategic Fund, which is the ones that can sign off because basically the state captures the school tax and uh, that has to be approved at the state. So that would, but in order to go to that, all of the other pieces, the Brownfield Authority, the city and the county have to approve it first. Thank you. Do we have any other comment on that? Okay. Do we have any commissioners that want to make a comment on that? I would just say, you know, this is, we, we've done a bunch of these and, you know, it's just an excellent program. I always tell people, you know, Gratiot County, we're like experts, you know, thanks to greater Gratiot development at, 
you know, turning what would otherwise be undevelopable prof, you know, you know, parcels and properties into something that, you know, provides a gooder service and then eventually gets back on the tax rolls that, you know, full or greater value than what it was before. And so, you know, and, and I know the people, the, the, the city is in Elma is very excited about the, the project. And, you know, we keep hearing that there's not, you know, enough housing and there's not enough hotel space. So, so this is a, a good project. Okay. Anything else? Uh, hey, I'm here now. <laughs> Hi, Sam. Hey, how are we doing? <laughs> uh, I had mentioned at the Brownfield meeting, some of us have got a real job, George. Uh, I had mentioned at the Brownfield meeting <laughs> that um, we have one of these projects. It's, it's not a, a Brownfield development project, but we have, there's a hotel in St. John's where I have a business and uh, downtown on Main Street. And I'm amazed how well they do. And uh, they seem to be full all the time. And uh, I tried to uh, make a deal out when I was trying to hire some funeral directors to, to stay with them and rent by month from them. And they, they're just sold out. I mean, they're packed. And so I think it's a really good thing for Alma. Great use for that building. Okay. Um, Matt, do we have any public that want to make a comment on that? It is a public meeting. Nobody has raised their hand. I do see one person joined in by telephone. I'm not exactly sure who that is, but if oh, anybody okay. would like to make public comment, I welcome them to unmute themselves. And the person on the phone, they can unmute themselves by dialing star six. Okay. I hear noises, but I don't know what it pertains to. I guess if there's no other comments, I'd move that we close the hearing. Support. Okay, moved and supported that we close the public hearing. Any other discussion? I missed who supported that. Uh, I did, Chuck. Okay. We are ready to call the roll then. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Bunting. Yes. Commissioner Lambrick. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Bailey. Yes. All right. Very good. We've closed the public hearing and now we have to consider ex uh, adopting uh, the uh, resolution uh, for the Brownfield. I make a motion we adopt the resolution. That's what you need. Yep. Support. Moved and supported. Is there any other discussion? When the clerk is ready, she may call the roll. Commissioner Bunting. Yes. Commissioner Lambrick. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Bailey. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, for all your help. Appreciate it. Thanks, George. Appreciate the opportunity to present it. Very, very good. All right, next on the agenda is uh, consideration of consent calendar, board minutes, communication, recommendations from committees. Will we adapt the consent calendar? Support. Moved and supported. Do we have any discussion? When you're ready, Angie, call the roll. Angie, oh, I don't hear you. You're muted, Angie. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Commissioner Lambert. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Bunting. Yes. Commissioner Bailey. Yes. All righty. We're down to the administrator's report. Tracy? Well, hey, everybody. Um, of course, in recent weeks, I've been doing these meetings from my office, and um, Chuck is giving me a wonderful idea that uh, perhaps uh, in the next few months, I'll just do these meetings from my car. Because uh, it just uh, <laughs> looks pretty good there, you trendsetter, you. Um, <laughs> I really 
what I want to spend some time on tonight uh, for my administrator's report is to uh, do a quick overview of what's going on in this building um, as it relates to COVID-19. I'm gonna tell you the bulk of my time gets spent on various things related to this. And um, because there's a fair amount of interest and activity uh, uh, on this in our building, it seemed appropriate that I would uh, spend some time tonight. I have a few slides that I will go to right now. And I think that you should be seeing slides. Am I correct? Correct. Yes. Okay, very good. All right, so uh, just by very way of very quick review, uh, significant dates include um, the uh, date of the governor's order uh, sending us all home, and then our return to work on the 15th of June. Um, of course, a lot of uh, controversy about that. On the 2nd of October, the Michigan Supreme Court uh, declared that the governor exceeded her authority under the uh, Governor's Emergency Powers Act. Uh, so uh, her executive orders really ended up having no effect. Between October 14th and November 15th, uh, MIOSHA, the Michigan Occupational Safety and Health Administration and the uh, Department of Health and Human Services issued some orders um, geared toward safety in the workplace. MIOSHA, and of course it's MIOSHA that is uh, charged with overseeing um, our activities in maintaining a, a safe and healthy workplace for our employees. So the October 14th order covered the list of things that you see here. Uh, in early June, I put in front of you because it fell under the governor's executive order, um, a preparation and response plan for our response to COVID, what we were going to do uh, to protect our, our workers. Uh, once the executive orders went away, uh, this was picked up by the MIOSHA order and indeed we, we have that plan. And otherwise it's just um, everything else that we've been doing. Um, we have to uh, find people that are sick and to encourage them to stay away. We do our health screening. Uh, we're doing remote work where possible, uh, a health screening and so forth. You, you can see the list there. Um, on October 29th, Health and Human Services stepped in and addressed capacity limits at gatherings, no more than 100, no more than 50, no more than 25. Uh, also um, imposed the face mask requirements and uh, reinforced contact tracing requirements or re, uh, reimposed those um, as requirements in our state. And then on the 15th, just on Sunday, uh, DHHS um, uh, uh, issued uh, another order uh, that limited uh, capacity uh, in gatherings further. Interestingly, it required remote learning for high schools and colleges, um, uh, education uh, at other uh, levels is to be uh, left to local officials. Interestingly, sports uh, are okay if there is enhanced testing done of folks who are participating. Uh, face masks still re uh, required and contact tracing. And contact tracing, of course, is uh, anyone who tests positive or is, is ill with COVID-19, uh, there must be an examination or a, a list made or consideration of everyone who came into contact with that period, with that individual for a period of 15 minutes or, or more, uh, those people must be notified and they must uh, quarantine or, or uh, isolate. So, uh, so what we have done in the workplace, uh, there's really nothing new since our return on the 15th of June, we've got the hand sanitizer units, we provided masks to folks, all our employees, and we required that they wear them. We're doing enhanced cleaning in high touch areas and we're using the chemicals and products that are uh, recommended by the CDC. Uh, we're doing the health screening uh, at the entryway. We're trying to limit traffic in and out of our offices. Uh, and we're encouraging actually that our interaction with one another here in the building be done uh, by email and telephone. 
uh, also encouraging members of the public to receive service from our offices by email and telephone uh, to limit folks in and out of the building and to limit um, uh, contact by our staff with members of the public. So why have we done all this? Why have we done all this? Well, we are hearing now, of course, about uh, the uh, increase of COVID cases, the surge all over the country. And so too, are we seeing this in Gratiot County? I just picked up our numbers as of October 6th. I wanna, want you to see what's happened here in just a six week period from the 6th of October to the 16th of November. Prior to October 6th, we were just kind of humming along. Our case levels were pretty low. Our deaths fortunately were very low. Um, and here you can see that we began on October 6th to inch up uh, from the 6th to the 8th. So just in two days, we gained 11 cases. Uh, then in just about five more days, we gained a bunch. Uh, in two days, we gained um, you know, 15. And this is where we really began to spike. So from the 15th of October to the 22nd, so that's less than a week, uh, we, we gained 38 cases. And then we were off to the races. From the 22nd of October to the 2nd of November, we were at 572. And now from the 2nd of November to the 16th of November, uh, just two weeks, we have increased from the 572 to the 1037. So we're really off to the races now. Fortunately, our deaths have remained uh, fairly stable. We are at 18 deaths uh, here in Gratiot County. Um, uh, everyone regrettable, but uh, fortunately we're not adding to that count or haven't added dramatically during this period. Um, the counties to our south and our west are also uh, spiking. Montcalm County has uh, 1,200 cases, 1,204, so they have more than we do. Um, by, you know, 130 something. Clinton County, um, 1,990 cases. So almost 2,000 cases in Clinton County. So um, everybody's spiking and just going um, a little bit. Uh, we're really having some trouble controlling this. Closer to home and, and here in the courthouse, I'm going to say that we kept cases out of our courthouse for four months. Uh, but then our luck ran out. And to date, we have had four of our staff, our peers, our colleagues, we know have tested positive. And what's a little bit um, disturbing, and it emphasizes the importance of our health screening at the entryway. One person came to work, knew he didn't feel well, but he thought it was that what he was experiencing was leftover from a previous illness. No, it was COVID. Another person came into the workplace thinking, oh, I just have a cold. Well, no, it was COVID. Um, and a third person came in thinking it was just, you know, just a headache, just a headache. Well, no, it was COVID. So it has been very important that people submit to this health screening and not self-diagnose. We don't ask people at the entryway, do you have COVID? We ask about these symptoms. And uh, these folks, I think, probably did some self-diagnosis, minimized what they were experiencing, and uh, so they came into the building. In addition to illness, I mean, we hate to think of any person uh, being ill, um, but the, the really the larger impact on our operation is that and this, we do this uh, contact tracing. For each person who tests positive, we need to determine who that person had contact with in our building, in the workplace for 15 minutes or more. And that's 15 minutes or more all at once or 15 minutes total uh, over a period of uh, 24 hours. So we have to identify all of those people and it can be very difficult for some folks to remember, but we do the best we can. Then we have to send all those folks away and tell them you have to quarantine for two weeks out of, of the courthouse, um, out, you know, just away from work, or in the case of attorneys, you have to stay out of the building and you can't come uh, to this building to practice. Um, 
today we have uh, 925 hours of lost productivity. Um, that's by those that have been ill, those that have been quarantined. That does also include though, our parents who have had to stay home with their children um, when schools have been closed or the children are ill or have had close contact. So uh, what this does not count though, is that the many hours that folks have worked from uh, home who have, um, uh, we've given them laptops, they've gone home, we've been satisfied that there is work that they can do uh, from home. But the folks who really cannot, um, who are left behind, your coworkers, uh, they're left to pick up those phone calls, the extra traffic at the counters, the extra data entry. So uh, this really does have um, a negative effect on, on everyone in the workplace. What I am seeing, you know, we did a lot, we did a lot of upfront training, putting measures into place, telling people what they needed to know. But th this is what I continue to see. And that is some folks are coming to work ill. I cited the three cases that did end up being COVID, but we, you know, we have people coming to work. Um, well, we had one person come to work who had a cough and this was a different cough, it was a new cough. Um, and she got through the health screening uh, when a coworker pointed out to her, geez, you have a cough and it makes me very uncomfortable that you are here. She said, yes, but um, the deputies knew it and they didn't stop me. Um, that's unfortunate because we, we need to be doing more self-regulating. Don't put the deputies in that position. So it's very, very frustrating when we see people, and I went through the first three earlier, but it's very frustrating when we see people either self-diagnosing, uh, dismissing symptoms that they are having, or just thinking that it's, uh, it is for someone else to make a determination about whether they should be at work. I can tell you that I did uh, uh, do a version of this presentation with department heads this afternoon, uh, emphasizing all of this, uh, reminding everyone about what, because we know what to do and we just have to remind everyone to do what we know to do. Um, and then department heads have been tasked with holding a meeting with their staff to review all of these things also. Additional observations are some things that we talked about. You know, don't walk in and out of offices freely, even if you've got the mask on. Uh, at the very beginning of this, in June, we talked about um, rather than coming in to drop off a piece of paper, scan that thing in and send it by email or drop it in the mailbox that's uh, down the hallway. To talk with one another, uh, use the telephone or the email and encourage your customers to get the service they need by telephone or email. Uh, this, I think we've pretty much stopped doing entirely, uh, communicating to folks that we really prefer to provide service uh, by telephone or email. Uh, again, asking folks internally drop documents in the department mailbox or scan and send. Also, uh, at the very beginning, I left it to um, certainly the elected officials, but also department heads. You make a decision about whether you want your staff to be wearing masks at their desks. And, um, and that was fine. Folks talked about it, made, made their decisions. Um, I think that though, when we're in very tight spaces and we do have, I don't know, a handful of offices where staff are sitting very closely together, we're really gonna have to, <coughs> people by and large are not wearing masks in those tight spaces and we're going to have to reevaluate that. Um, what we really need to do in response to all of this, we have a few months of experience now. We've really got to make sure that people are fully disclosing on those health screening documents. Um, I recently, there are a few additional symptoms that the CDC has added to the list of symptoms that may indicate COVID. I've added those symptoms to the health screening documents. Uh, I'm also requiring now that employees sign their health screening documents um, uh, each day when they uh, first report to work. Uh, folks need to self-assess self and take some responsibility. If you have a symptom, uh, you, you need to decide if you ought to be coming in into work or not. Uh, follow, we, we know what to do. So follow the exist, existing safety protocols, wash hands, wear a mask, wear it properly, limit your contacts and so forth. 
Um, and, you know, we can all forget these things. I shared a story about how I walked out of my office, went outside and came back and I had forgotten to grab a mask. And um, you know, this can happen to all of us. So we can all play a role in just kind of gently reminding one another uh, when we forget about one of these things. And what is very concerning, and this ha has been a big issue here, is we as employers, we cannot uh, instruct people about what they can or cannot do when they are not in the workplace. Um, <clears throat> so we've just got to uh, encourage our employees to make good decisions. We've had folks that have uh, traveled when um, the, uh, our health officials were telling us, no, travel's not a good idea. Sitting in cars with people uh, without masks for many hours, getting from one destination to another. People who have gone to weddings, been in close contact, funerals. Uh, these super spreader events, um, and uh, and we just need to limit contact. Um, oh, there was one uh, uh, one individual that went to. Well, I had a couple of people that had to quarantine because uh, they uh, had close contact with friends. Uh, a day or two later, friend reports, "Oh, I'm positive." So then they needed to quarantine, and you know. Maybe this was the year that we just couldn't get together with friends to watch the Michigan, Michigan State football game. So these are the things we need to do. These are the things that we need to remind one another about. So we've had, we've had positive cases here. The greater um, uh, impact to us is the contact tracing. And of course, uh, Jeff Wood and I, uh, you know, our lives have just been kind of handed over. Um, uh, to this uh, COVID process, consulting with, with folks and just keeping up with things. So that's where we are. I, I had asked uh, folks today about um, any ideas they might have about things that we can do, additional things we can do. Um, we do have uh, some folks now I'm trying to get back to that. We do have uh, folks that are implementing um, uh, kind of staff um, uh, alternating, um, having half the staff work remotely and the other half be in the office and then switch so that there's less contact. Um, doing those sorts of things to ensure that, you know, just to try to keep all of the staff from getting ill at once. This is a particular concern of the sheriff's, of course, and he's had some incidents of close calls and it wouldn't take much for the sheriff who I know is listening and did participate in our meeting this afternoon would not take much for him to just not be able to uh, cover the bases. I think Angie is going to begin uh, rotating her staff in and out. Uh, my staff have been um, authorized to work remotely a day or two or three a week um, as it works for, for them. Now we do have one person who uh, is working uh, entirely remotely to the extent she could work because she is at home with children uh, because the schools have closed. So that's what's going on here. I think that, um, well, you know, there, there's chatter and talk, but that's where things are. Um, the order continues and the advice continues to be in place and has throughout that any office work that can be done remotely ought to be done remotely. Now, you know, we're, we're, we are here serving the public and doing the people's work. So you know, we have to take that message and just kind of consider how we can uh, meet our responsibility to serve the public while, uh, while uh, also keeping everyone safe. But so I, I, I very much welcome your observations, your suggestions understanding that the overall objective, the objective is to keep our, our staff safe, uh, to keep members of the public safe while also uh, providing service. I'll take instantly your suggestions. Um, I did have a question, Tracy. Um, I'm just wondering, I was on a call this week with the, uh, this week or last week, I think it was last week, um, with the uh, um, prison and they have um, some out there that have the uh, virus. When you give that, when they, when we get this number of how many people have that do have it in Gratiot County, does that include the prison or it doesn't include the prison? 
It would include the prison, but um, our case counts include those that live in Gratiot County. So if any of those folks live in another county, it's going to go to the case count of that particular county. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Okay. I was just wondering. Sure. Well, my question to you of any additional suggestions that you have or concerns or uh, just ideas about how we continue our service while keeping everyone safe. It's an open question. So please, as you have ideas, I'll very much appreciate your call or your, your email. And uh, with that, George, I guess I will uh, call that the end of my administrator's report. All right. Uh, Tracy, you. I do have one other thing I'd like to mention. Um, I do have free time. And if there's anything I can do to help at the courthouse, I'd be glad to come over and volunteer um, in any way that I can. If it was to run things back and forth to, a, I mean, I could wear a mask. I even got a shield for over my head um, that I bought just recently from Sam's Club. But I'd be glad to help in any way I can uh, throughout the county. And that would be any place, any place where they not, might need me. I appreciate that, Jan. And I'll uh, keep that in mind and pass that along as I hear of others that are uh, short uh, resources. Thank you. I would even help at the sheriff's office if they want me to <laughs> drive a car around her. <laughs> Just kidding there. <laughs> Put her in the jail. Put her in the jail, Sheriff. <laughs> All righty. Well, I just have a real quick comment. I, I, I think we do a pretty good job of getting people in and out of the courthouse. I think it, it frustrates some people sometimes. I know with our business that we're we're probably to the courthouse about every day, every other day. And, and the staff works real well to drop our stuff off in that little entryway so we don't have to enter. Um, and it's it, hopefully our staff can, as you say, get up to speed a little bit more about what they're doing because they have pretty access. They come there every day. And, and, and a few of them could really kind of spoil the whole thing and shut the courthouse down if we don't have enough employees there. So uh, I think we're doing a good job of the outside world coming in there. And, and, you know, we just need to stress how important it is to keep that place as safe as we can. That's right. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, I agree also with you, Sam. All righty. Okay. Very good. Uh, going on now to commissioner's reports, Chuck. I don't have anything, George. All right. Thank you, Tim. Nope. Me neither. Sam. Yeah, we had a couple of three meetings. We, um, I was to a meeting last night at North shade and, uh, or to, uh, yeah, North shade and then, uh, last week to new Haven windmills. I'm amazed how fast these things are going up. They're firing them up. They're they're They've got them running. GTE or uh, no, it's not GTE. Cons Consumers. it's another company who's who's built a windmill. Oh, it, um, oh in Venergy? No, no, it's the actual company that built the, the road. They're coming oh. in and they're gonna they're gonna hook them all up. Testing to the Motorola. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're gonna start testing them. They think they'll be online at the end of the end of December. Uh, they'll be pumping power out. I'm just amazed how fast this thing turned around. I was talking to a couple people from Consumers last night about it, and he said it worked real well with Consumers. Some of the plants they built here, the other people built them and then they come in and took them over and then had to figure this all out. These guys kind of went right through the build with them. And uh, I just amazed how quick this thing is up and running and, and they're going to be producing power. Uh, the other thing in Fulton Township, uh, I was to a meeting and we're going to get this communications tower. They may have started digging here this week. I haven't been over by there, but they think they'll have this communications tower up about the 10th of uh, December as far as the actual structure. And then they have the, the equipment all, all bought or purchased or brought in or whatever. They think they'll have that thing running for the, I think it's 800 megahertz uh, police radio fire and all that for down in the Southern part of the County. That'll be up and running hopefully yeah. by the end of the December. So uh, that's coming right along. Good. Very good. Jan. Uh, yes. I've had a few meetings. I had one of the meetings with Michigan works I believe that was last week. And um, uh, we're restructuring, getting ready. Also, that's going to be coming in front of the board in 2021 uh, to renew the contract. So we're going to be working on that. I also had a meeting with MMR. That was last week. Well, you know, I'm confused what weeks we are. They go by so quickly. That was last... Um, Thursday. Thursday, yeah. Last Thursday. And... Um, that also, 
Um, that was an interesting meeting. Um, I'm going to get the minutes around and also send out um, our last meetings, which would have been four months ago, to um, our clerk so she can get them out to all the commissioners for the next meeting. And then um, there was a lot that went on, so I'll probably be working on those minutes and getting back with Dan and um, Brent uh, to help make sure that I've got all the right um, uh, messages in there. I also had a meeting with the prison. It was online. Uh, that was kind of a short meeting, 15, 20 minutes, I believe. And it was basically to get a number of that they do have cases. They have cases with the colon, uh, with the, with the, or the um, virus. And um, that was kind of interesting. But what I thought was real interesting, interesting was that they talked about there was some outsiders flying in the, um, is it called drones? They go over the, you know, that fly around in that somebody was trying to send phones in and send drugs into the prison. And, and so they were able to stop that. They're also asking that the, that, that we keep eye open if we see anybody uh, suspicious that are, that are flying these around near the prison to let the prison know or 911. So, um, you know, just kind of not a whole lot. Just, I think the big issue is the virus and, um, and the concerns uh, everywhere, not only here in our community, the state, but also in our prisons and hospitals. So that's about pretty much what I have to say today. Thanks, Jan. Did you, um, do you, George, do you have anything to add on to mobile medical response meeting? You were there too. Yeah, I was there, but I think you've, you've covered that. So we'll just go on. Um, consideration of new business. Uh, we've got Keegan going to be coming up here. How's it going? Good. All right. So what I've got is uh, a revised apportionment report and the interlocal agreement for uh, the designated assessor. Um, so I guess I'll uh, we'll get the uh, apportionment report out of the way first. So we have just a slight change in the apportionment report. Uh, Hamilton Pass a millage on the third for uh, road and bridges and fire and rescue. And that came out to an extra 2.25 mils. Um, that's on uh, page 65 in your uh, packets. And so I've got that highlighted. And if anybody wants to go through the apportionment report again, uh, I'm more than happy to do that. Or if you just want to stick to the changes, uh, I'm completely fine with that as well. Do we have any questions before we move on? Go ahead, Keegan. All right, so. Yep, that is the only uh, difference, uh, the only addition to the apportionment. Okay, all right. The yeah, Hamilton Township uh, Millage. Okay. Now, do we need to uh, have action on that, Keegan? Uh, yep, it needs to be approved. Okay. Move approval of the revised or updated uh, equalization report as presented. Support. Uh, apportionment report, too. Sorry. Yeah, apportionment report. That's, yeah. I think that's what I said. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I have a move and a support. Do we have any other discussion? When the clerk is ready. Commissioner Bunting. Yes. Commissioner Lambrick. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Bailey. Yes. All righty. And their designated assessor. Keegan. Yep. So uh, what I've got here is the interlocal agreement uh, for the designated assessor. Um, so I uh, just want to start off by kind of going over what the designated assessor is. Um, basically, so in 2018, uh, Michigan passed the Public Act 6, 6, or 660, Property Assessing Reform. This act requires that each county have a designated assessor on file by the year 2021. So the designated assessor position is a qualified individual 
who will step in as the assessor of record for any assessment unit that is deemed non-compliant by the state tax commission. And so for an order for an assessment unit to be deemed not compliant by the state, uh, the following process has to And uh, please stop me or ask any questions as I'm going. I know I can go fast sometimes. So uh, let me know if I need to slow down. So in order for uh, an assessment unit to be deemed non compliant, they first need to fail an AMAR review. That is an audit of minimum assessing requirements. These reviews are done every five years. Gratiot County had one done in uh, 2019. So once uh, that review is failed, the assessment unit needs to create a corrective action plan, basically a plan stating how they're gonna get their assessment unit back on track. Uh, once that plan is submitted, if the state accepts that, they move on to the following year, they're gonna do a, basically a recheck on how that plan was put into action. If they, de or, uh, if they deem that plan was not followed, then that assessment unit is uh, deemed not compliant. So it's kind of a couple year process in order for that to happen. Um, but at that point, when the unit is deemed non-compliant, that they have three choices. They can either hire a contract with another assessor, um, they can allow the state tax commission to assume jurisdiction of the role, or they can contract with a designated assessor that's on file. Um, and basically with that, they only have two options. The state has said that uh, they're gonna make it too expensive to allow them to assume jurisdiction of the role. So basically their choices are hire another assessor or contract with a designated assessor. Um, so this interlocal agreement that I'm presenting, it has to be approved uh, by you, the board, and the majority of the assessment units in the county. At the moment we have, uh, I believe it is approved by eight local units at the moment. Uh, how, many, how many units do we have to have? Uh, so we got 19 assessment units plus the county, so we need 11. Okay, so, all right. Yep, and so I'm asking uh, the board today to approve Kathy Roseland as the designated assessor for Gratiot County. Okay. Um, and basically what uh, Kathy did is uh, she made a proposal for her plan as the designated assessor. Um, and she's actually the only... Uh, applicant that we received. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> I'd like to add, if I could, Keegan, that yeah, there sure. was a significant township involvement. Uh, Keegan ran, uh, he, he did do a solicitation, um, uh, sought interest in, and uh, others to uh, submit a proposal. The townships were involved in the criteria uh, just every step of the way. So this is not something that's being done to them or over them. There was significant evolve, involvement. Once uh, Keegan had uh, Kathy, Kathy Roseland's um, proposal, he sent it out to the townships to make sure that they had no uh, objection to this individual as the selection. So again, I want to uh, emphasize that piece, both so that you know that the townships were very much involved and also so that once again, you have an opportunity to hear what a great job Keegan is doing. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Um, Kathy, do you want to make any comment? No, I, Keegan covered everything. Um, okay. And there's plenty of information on this. So if you know you can go to the state tax commission website and they offer all kinds of information on this and what it boils down to is the assessing reform it's a mandate. And I just I feel it's my obligation to the county i'm not asking for a retainer fee I know a lot of um, assessors are requesting retainer fees I don't feel the need to request any retainer fee for this. Very good. Thank you. Keegan, right. Keegan or Kathy, could, mm -hmm. could you tell me when this would kick in again? How would this work where she would have to come in place or how would this? Uh, so basically the designated assessor needs to be on file by 2021. Uh, but as, as the process goes for a, a unit to be deemed not compliant, 
I believe the earliest that can happen is 2023. Um, so when would Kat, so Kathy would be the assessor? I mean, she would work or she would be if there was a problem with our assessors or? Yeah, so basically Kathy would remain uh, essentially on retainer in case a, a situation arised where the township needed an assessor. And what I would that so situation be, Keegan? I think he's asking, what would the circumstances be? Uh, How would she be engaged? Would cause, yeah. That would okay, cause yep, Kathy so, to be activated. Uh, so the assessment unit needs to be deemed non-compliant by the state tax commission. And it's quite a process for them to be deemed non-compliant. They first have to fail an AMAR review. Uh, that's an audit of minimum assessing requirements. Uh, once they fail that review, they need to create a corrective action plan to submit to the state. If the state accepts that plan, then the following year, they'll do uh, basically a review of how that plan was put into action. And if they deem that plan was not put into action, then they're uh, deemed not compliant. I see. So at okay. that point, um, the uh, assessment unit can either hire a new assessor or they can contract with the designated assessor. I see, okay. Yep. All right. And, and that, so, I mean, that the, unit pays, pays for the designated assessor or other assessor, is that correct, Keegan? That's not, yes. yep. the county does and, not fit foot the bill for that. Yep, correct. And Kathy has her rates uh, right on this uh, agreement. Yeah. And I've done uh, a decent amount of looking at other counties' agreements, um, and her rates are pretty fair uh, compared to a lot of them. So. All right. Everybody satisfied? Yep. We'll entertain a motion to accept a, a designated uh, assessor. So moved. I'll second it. <clears throat> Any other questions? When the clerk is ready. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Bunting. Yes. Commissioner Lambrick. Yes. Commissioner Bailey. Yes. Thank you, Kagan. Appreciate it. Oh, thank, thank you. you. I agree. appreciate it. I'm really excited about this. I think Kathy's going to be uh, absolutely great for this position. Yep, thank I do you. too. Thank you, I, Kathy. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Yep, bye-bye. <laughs> okay, well, next on the agenda is, uh, I believe, snow plowing. Well, the snow has begun to fall. I walked home in it last night, and I stared out my window at it today. Uh, we are ready to request your approval of snow plowing contracts. As usual, we sent out a request for quotes. We had three companies respond. Uh, Searles, with whom we've done service the last handful of years. Uh, also a new player for us, which is Lawnscape. I think it's Lawnscape. Uh, I just don't recall who the third was or what the third was, but its rates were quite a bit higher. We would like to have two uh, folks working for us this year. And the reasoning is this. Um, if, Searles, if Searles were to discontinue service um, or you know, any, uh, there'd be any kind of an issue there, we, we would like to have cultivated another uh, vendor for this. We have no experience with this uh, other company. And so we, we thought we, and we offered to them uh, handling just two of our lots, and it's those that are on opposite ends of the route, uh, the animal shelter at one end and the health department at the other. Uh, Searles would continue to do the bulk of the work, which would be the jail parking lot, the courthouse handicap parking lot, which is essentially just the parking lot here uh, at the main entry, and the courthouse church parking lot also would do the jail parking lot uh, plow and salt on, on the weekends. So we'd like to um, just uh, test landscape, see how they do for us. Uh, always good to have uh, another vendor available um, so we don't find ourselves at the short end of, uh, of uh, any situation. So uh, the request is for you to approve uh, a contract with Searles and the contract with Lawnscape for snow plowing. What's your pleasure? So moved. 
I'll second it. Or moved and supported. Is there any other discussion? When the clerk's ready. Commissioner Lambrick. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Bunting. Yes. Commissioner Bailey. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, now we have uh, Department of Veterans Affairs to fill a seat on the board, I'm thinking. And is Sue to explaining this or just we're just gonna take it as is? Well, I, I actually attended the meeting, uh, the Veterans Committee meeting with this was being considered. They did have a resignation. They solicited um, uh, interest in the community for this position. Uh, I believe they had five candidates or five applicants express interest, which was, uh, it was pretty surprising to them. Uh, they talked this through pretty thoroughly and uh, arrived at uh, the recommendation of uh, this individual whose name I'm not able to. Barbara. Yes. Barbara. Uh, yes. What's your last name? Um, <laughs> coming. We're going. This is. Um, Barbara, what? I heard it. What's Barbara's last Rigone. name? It's Barbara Ragone. Ragone. Yeah. Rigone. So Barbara yeah. Ragone. Uh, yeah. Very qualified. Um, the. Um, uh, so the, the Veterans Committee uh, was uh, uniform, uh, unanimous in uh, making the selection and recommending uh, her to, to this board. Okay. Well, it's your pleasure, folks. Move that we appoint her to the board. Support. All right. We move that. We're moving to support that we uh, appoint Barbara Ragone the Veterans Affairs Board. Any other questions? Very none, I'll, uh, when the clerk's ready. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Bunting. Yes. Commissioner Lambert. Yes. Commissioner Bailey. Yes. Okay, it's that time of the meeting. It's not really on our agenda, but I know what time it is. It's time for the financial meeting. So we're going to have to uh, entertain a motion to suspend the uh, regular board meeting and enter a finance committee meeting. So moved. Board. Any other discussion? When the clerk is ready. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Bunting. Yes. Commissioner Lambrick. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Bailey. Yes. All right. It's all yours, Tim. Okay. Um, take a look at your agenda. First up is the financial administrator's report. Chris. Well, good evening, board. Um, we've been uh, very busily preparing for our audit that is coming up. Believe it or not, the auditors will be working remotely, possibly some on site starting next week. So we have that to look forward to. And then they, that'll be their preliminary review and they'll be back in the first week of January for uh, to, to wrap up. So that's what we're busy preparing for now. Um, so you know, Becky Clark that works with me, she's instrumental in getting all of this stuff put together on the expenditure side of it. And while um, it was touched on earlier, Kaylin continues to do a great job finding um, materials that we need to put into uh, the, the, the practices that Tracy touched on earlier related to COVID-19. So staff are very, very busy. Um, I'm gonna run through the financial reports with you. I'll share them on your screen like I have before. Um, first up is the county's cash balances. Um, and you'll see the trend that we have going back from August of 2020 
September and October. Between July and August, we see a significant jump here in, in cash balance. And what that tells me is that, um, in, in our general fund, and what that tells me is that uh, our, our residents paid their taxes earlier this year than they did in the previous year. So I would suspect that we're not gonna see as much of a delinquent tax amount as we have in the past, but it's following the trend of the 2017, 2018 year. And that was also a year we, where we had a very small amount of delinquent tax. Does anybody have any questions related to the cash balances? So the whole reason that I share the cash balance with you is because it is it is a uh, it's a snapshot of the county's balance sheet, so you can see what assets they have. Now moving on to the next item to present: the general fund revenues, expenditures, and transfers. This is a new uh, worksheet for you guys that I put together. Um, and what this does is it, it basically gives you the cliff note version of the operating statement for the county. So now on a monthly basis, what I will be presenting to you is basically the balance, uh, the cliff notes of the balance sheet and the income statement for the county, which is our complete um, picture of our financials. Uh, and what you see here is I went back and I grabbed all the historical data all the way back to October of 2018. The top line that we have are the revenues that we brought in for the month. The second line transfers in and out. No, this is just for the general fund. So this would be transfers in from other funds to the general fund would be the second row. The third row expenditures out of the general fund and the fourth row, the transfers out. Uh, a typical example of a transfer out would be to the landfill fund to pay for some expenses at the landfill or to the child care fund to pay for the county's percentage of what we pay for in the child care fund. So what you see when we total all of our revenues and expenditures, we either have a negative number or a positive number. Negative number, we're spending more money than we bring in in that particular month. The positive number, we're bringing in more money than we spend. And the majority of the time, the only time we're going to run a positive number, running in the black, is gonna be in September. That's because that is the month that we collect our general operating millage. And the general operating millage is the largest funding source for the general fund. So you'll see that it, this just gives you an idea of the inflows and the outflows of, of the county. Does anybody have any questions related to the schedule? With no questions, and you can ask them at any time throughout this. I'm gonna move on then to the October check disbursement report for those checks that were for $10,000 and above. I know that everybody is, is working remotely today, so I will scroll through this slowly, but if you have any questions related to the check report, feel free to let me know. Um, I did not see anything out of the ordinary. No, it looked pretty normal to me. We're still at the end of cleaning up the end of fiscal year um, 2020. So you're gonna see a lot of legal advice coming in, uh, lawyers that are getting in their, their bills from earlier in the year. Uh, 
nutrition equipment here. There was some additional grant money that was available for COA. So they were able to go out and buy some things that they needed to improve their kitchens and their delivery systems. We have some bond payments here. When you see it going to different banks. Chris, can I just ask you a quick question on when you were just mentioning these lawyers getting their bills in, does somebody approve those and say, yeah, this is right? I mean, do they send that to, to the court Absolutely. System? We have, we have a, a whole department now that the state funds in the indigent defense fund. Yeah. Um, and they, these bills run through them. I see. So when you Except, get them, they've already been checked over. And... That's correct. Uh, somebody yeah. who knows what these people are doing are approving this. Yeah. 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 <coughs> I didn't want you to think you didn't know what you were doing, but. Well, it, it'd be, it would be impossible for me to know <laughs> yeah, every that's right, person. That's right, yeah. Yeah, that's tough to change. That. That's right, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it adds up. It's like the bills out at the drain, the drain commission. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, have, I rely on the drain commissioner to approve those. I and see. If he doesn't approve them, I ask him to approve them because he knows what's going on on a daily basis there. I do not. I make sure they're accurate. I make sure that they're eligible and I make sure that they're put in the correct place. Okay. And there were some um, on the screen here, there were some that I removed some names from some of the legal bills. So that's why there's some blank spots in this. Some of them were actually titled with names of juveniles that were represented and I didn't feel that was correct. Hey, uh, Chris. He reported I, to you. Yeah, Chris, I see there's only two attorneys I you did there used to be more attorneys that were involved in that? We do have a lot more attorneys that participate in this. Um, but they had gotten their bills into us sooner, so we didn't see them in this month's. I see. Okay. It's the timing of when they submit for payment. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over to the complete check register. <clears throat> when you look at that one, Jan, you see that there's a bunch of the other attorneys that are part of the rotation there. Yeah, I see them now. But no, I was I was surprised that there wasn't more in with um, with the uh, ones that 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 we first saw there, Todd and um, oh, I can't right. think of her, Catherine. Some yeah, I usually I thought I was surprised because usually, like I know I know of a couple attorneys that kind of put theirs in like once a month or at the end of a month, and I didn't see any of those. And with that, so you're saying that some of those I didn't check the dates. I should have. Anyway, it's okay. I just wanted to ask. Well, the date would be the date they submitted the invoice to us, not the date of the service in this oh. report that you see. Okay. And, and I'm certain the, yeah. The first report was checks that were over $10,000. So they had accumulated a lot of invoices that then totaled over $10,000, which is why they were triggered in the first report. Uh-huh. Oops. Okay, I guess there are no questions on the checks besides that one. Okay, Chris, anything else you wanna add? Not at this time, thank you. Okay, with that, uh, why don't we move on to the treasurer's report? I think, there's Michelle. Hello. <laughs> Uh, I've provided you with the, the same three reports I always do. Um, nothing odd and ordinary, um, typical month. Um, taxes being paid are a little slow right now, but that's normal with holidays coming up. People would rather buy Christmas presents than pay their taxes. Um, 
Thursday, I'm going to have my second sale out in the parking lot of the courthouse. I'm not expecting a huge turnout. It's the second sale. I don't have very many properties left to offer. Um, so just a heads up there if anybody's around and sees a bunch of people out in the parking lot. That's that's what that is. Michelle, um, in the second sale, did they start at like a hundred dollars? We just we we got a flat we don't we don't go back to the don't we drop the price? How does Yeah, I'm gonna start out at fifty dollars. Fifty dollars. Okay, I I couldn't remember what it was, but I just know it, it no longer is at the what they owe. It's just you know, whatever we can get. Yeah, we did. We just want to get them sold and back on the tax roll. But yeah, just not a whole lot of interest in the sale this year. So Michelle, is there any homes that are for sale or just land? There is a vacant home in Wheeler that was a mortgage foreclosure. Um, but um, we have a lot of people check keys out and they said it's completely gutted. So it would be it would be quite the project. But uh -huh. 50 bucks. Well, yeah. Uh, what is that sell again? I might come to it. Thursday at nine out in the parking lot. Okay. Nine o'clock in the parking lot. Okay. Is it listed on the treasurer's page? What's up for sale, Michelle, for the final sale? Yes. Okay. Any other questions for Michelle? I just noticed that the investment report, you know, we, we still have a couple, we still have a couple investments that are earning more than 1%, but I also see that they're going to be expiring. So then we'll be, then we'll be back to, you know, one or less. It's just not been. I know. Good. You got those ones when you did and lock those in, you know? Yeah. Those, so. Yeah. Okay, if there's no other questions for the treasurer, uh, thanks, Michelle. Financial business that anyone has or questions. Okay. And I don't think there's anybody waiting to make a public comment. I don't see anybody else up except for the sheriff. Okay, with that, I'll then take a motion to return to the regular board meeting for the purpose of paying the bills. So move. Support. Okay, motion by Smith, support by Murphy. Uh, Angie, whenever you can, call the roll. Commissioner Bunting. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Bailey. Yes. Commissioner Lambrick. Yes. All right, that passes and we're back to you, George. Thank you very much. This is right, actually, has run fairly smooth for as many people are on Zoom. So I'm, We're getting I'm happy, happy, happy to that. One, <laughs> one, one other note, I would plan on uh, board to have another Zoom meeting uh, the first. Um, I think things aren't gonna be changing much. If they do, I'll let you all know, but right now I would plan on Zooming for their next board meeting. Okay. Um, is there anything? Oh, public comments. Anybody wishing to make a public comment? Okay. All right. There we are done with our agenda. So that hey, would uh, go ahead. George, I, I think the reason that this noise bothers you is those ear things you have on. Oh. Can you hear this? <laughs> Yeah, I can hear it. <laughs> I can hear everything, Jan. <laughs> okay. Well, if there isn't anything else, I'll call the meeting adjourned. Okay. Take care, everybody. Okay, bye, -bye. bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank Come you. Come to all. visit if you'd like. <laughs>